Mike Bernard with us on Sunday mornings, as always, on GameDaySportsRadio.com. Mike, great day yesterday in college football, if if you like some exciting games and some blowouts, because we had a little bit of both. We had some shockers, too, out west. Washington getting by Oregon, 37-34. That kind of ends Oregon's college football playoff hopes and pretty much put a cap on Bo Nix, talk uh, about the Heisman race, let's just say that. And then on the Atlantic Coast, the ACC now has Coastal Division champions. The North Carolina Tar Heels, 36, Wake Forest, 34. So again, you know, we had a little bit of – uh, a little bit of everything yesterday in college football. Yeah, we did. And uh, the Pac-12, they caved to the pressure of November again. Uh, of course, or not only Oregon lost as a two-touchdown favorite, UCLA lost as a three-touchdown favorite. And both of those teams were – USC needed those teams to win out, and USC needed to beat one of those. But, you know, I don't think the Pac-12 is going to get there. As far as – the ACC, I believe that locks up the title game, right? Wouldn't it be North Carolina and Clemson? North Carolina and Clemson, regardless of what happens the last couple of weeks of the season here, the regular season here. Yeah, and then just just to show, just to remind us that this is 2022, that North Carolina Wake Forest game was 36 to 34, and it stayed under. Hey, listen, uh, Last year, North Carolina did not win a game on the road. This year, they're 6-0 and on the road. Their average margin of victory actually came down yesterday because they were at 3.6. So they're, they're good for a field goal win on the road no matter what. But uh, listen, I, the big game for me yesterday, and not really just because it's, it had a lot of implications, uh, but Alabama and Ole Miss – it was just a different feel. Last year, it was almost like Lane Kiffin was kind of, uh, as we said last week, poking the wounded bear. And this year, it was totally different. Lane's just all types of accolades towards Saban and Alabama. And the Rebels jumped out to an early lead. Bama fought back, uh, turned a late turnover right before half uh, into a touchdown and kind of cut into their lead. It was 17-14 at the break, Oh Miss. They went into the fourth quarter tied 24. I really liked Ole Miss's chances at that point. But the Bama defense really came to life in that uh, in that last quarter. Yeah, and the defense got stops in the second half. They held Ole Miss to seven second-half points. Uh, that was impressive. Even more impressive was they held the Rebels scoreless in the fourth quarter and Ole Miss was running all over them in the first half. Yeah, they were running up and down the field. Uh, Will Reichert uh, had a chip shot field going, broke the tie at uh, I think it was a, a, about 11 19 uh, to go in the game. And that was Alabama's first lead. And then No Miss goes three and out. Uh, a big fourth down stop by the tie defense with 627 to go in the game. It was only a three man rush, but that tied secondary forced Jackson Dart to scramble, and he was tackled before he could get to to the line to gain. Uh, And then Reichardt added another field goal. But Saban couldn't uh, let go of his his anxiety, and he he couldn't breathe until the ball bounced off the turf uh, with about 46 seconds to go. Uh, Ole Miss had a shot to the end zone that came up short. And no one was saying roll tide louder than Brian Kelly because now LSU is definitely going to Atlanta and will probably in all possibility face Georgia. Right. And, Coach, did it not look to you – I mean, because when you look at Saban's reactions in BCS title games, college football playoff games – he, did, he looked more happy and relieved to win that against Lane Kiffin than he did those title games. I think so. I, you know, he always talks about their identity. I think that this, this year's Alabama team, I think they found a little bit of their identity yesterday in, in Oxford, Mississippi. Well, a little too late for as far as Alabama standards, but my takeaways from this game is basically confirmation. This, is, this Alabama team, 
power rates lower than any Saban team back to his first year. And they would rank even lower if it weren't for Bryce Young, who at times is almost literally a one-man show. So we talked about it on the preview. Alabama, so now their last 18 SEC games, 11 have been decided by one score. The previous 54 conference games, only 10 were decided by one score. And look, for all those that don't want to hear it, it's not subjective. The SEC has closed the gap. They have. One thing, and again, I, I hate to put the – when you win, the quarterback gets too much credit. When you lose, he gets too much blame. But in my opinion, and Bryce Young is the difference in this Alabama team, uh, they would be five and four right now if not for Bryce Young. No, I agree. Five and four, six and three, um, you know, but because he makes plays, he's not getting protection. He doesn't have – now, granted, when the last eight years, Alabama has had unbelievable weapons, especially at receiver, but also running backs all over the NFL. He doesn't have that, so uh, he's having to do it on his own a lot of times. Well, Mike, I think Sonny Dykes was trying to tell us something last night. TCU 17, Texas 10. Uh, Kindred Miller, TCU, Bijan Robinson from Texas, that both have 1,000 yards rushing at this point in the season. This is the first game this season where we've had two 1,000-yard rushers in the same game. Everyone expected an offensive explosion. The TCU defense, they were all over Quinn Ewers early. Uh, he just never could get in sync. And both defenses showed up uh, early. Multiple first-half TCU possessions started in plus territory on, on Texas side of the 50, but the Longhorns held them score, uh, scoreless. Yours didn't get his first completion until 10.30 of the second uh, quarter. Now, he did throw an interception earlier, if we want to call that a completion, but he, he didn't complete one to a Texas guy until, uh, again, almost 10 minutes to go in the second quarter. Yeah, the, the total in this game, Coach, was 65. So odds makers, uh, handicappers, and average fan, no one expected a low-scoring game. These two teams put up less points than the Iowa-Wisconsin game. And, of course, Iowa-Wisconsin looks like, you know, a book of artifact and relics of back to the 40s. Their offenses are terrible. Um, and then this is even just as impressive Texas was held held to twenty eight rush yards. Yeah, the TCU defense they really made us. Uh, they really made a stand. There was no scoring in this game until right before halftime, and uh, uh, TCU got a short field goal, and then Kendrick Miller broke open a seventy five yard touchdown run with five oh eight left in the third. He was the first back this year to go over a hundred yards against that Longhorn defense. Puts the Frogs up 10 to 3. And I, I don't know what Texas special teams coordinator saw, but they kept going after the punter. They kept roughing the punter and they had them stopped. And then they got a third roughing the punter penalty that keeps a TCU dry alive. And uh, Dugan hits uh, Quentin Johnson on a third and long. And, uh, and that was a busted coverage also. He was just standing in the end zone by himself. That put the uh, Frogs up 17-3. to Texas squandered many opportunities in the red zone, but unforced errors just uh, kept the offense off the board. But now all of a sudden, people are leaving the stadium. Texas Longhorn folks, are there. they say, we're, we're not doing anything we're, today. We're, we're out of here. And then a defensive touchdown, a, a, touchdown, a rare mistake by uh, Max Duggan, uh, balls rolling around, defense scoops and scores, and all of a sudden you see on the cameras the fans start coming back in the stadium saying, hey, we might have a chance here. But Texas, the defense, even though they had played well, uh, just couldn't get a stop, and TCU locked it up, and now they're guaranteed a spot in the Big 12 championship game. Yeah, and maybe they kept going after the punts because they knew their offense was abysmal. They couldn't they couldn't move the ball. TCU gets the uh, – that in my opinion, the biggest hurdle because it was 17 to 10 and it wasn't really that close. 
Frogs were a touchdown underdog. They went outright. TCU, Coach, they won every meaningful stat line, including time of possession, 37 to 23. They still have to play on the road at Baylor, and Baylor looked like dog you know what last night. Uh, but then they play Iowa State, and you got to be careful that Iowa State team. They're underperformed, and Matt Campbell gets all the accolades, and they've got a lot of losses. That's a tough game. And then it looks like they're probably going to play K State in the title game. Let's uh, let's talk about the dumpster fire bowl. We've uh, we we uh, this is one of those. It's like a it's like a car wreck. You know, you don't want to look, but you can't take your eyes off of it. So. Texas A&M visits Auburn, Auburn 13, Texas A&M 10, and Cadillac Williams gets the win for Auburn. Kind of what we expected, as we said, this was an outmanned Auburn team, but they played very hard. A&M, I mean, they're, it's just, they're just an enigma. I just You don't know what to make of them. I, Jimbo's still going to be there in 2023, but big changes are going to come as far as staff goes especially offensively, Jimbo's not going to be calling plays next season. <laughs> well, why would you want to change the, the play calling? They punted their first nine possessions. They didn't get past the 39-yard line of Auburn until the fourth quarter. And, Coach, the, some of these Aggie players, they've checked out. Yeah. Yeah. They, you can just tell, you can watch on the sideline and, and see the body language. There was um, Mus Muhammad, the wide receiver. Uh, he didn't play last night because he wasn't going to play unless he could wear sleeves. And Jimbo said, no, my skill position players don't wear sleeves. And so he just took himself out of the game. He was, uh, it just didn't play. That, I, I don't even want to, I, I wouldn't want to be a fly on the wall in that complex. There's just too much drama uh, going on in, uh, in College Station right now. Is is that uh, the son of Musa Muhammad that played at Michigan State? I, you know, I'm not sure, but it very well could be because he is a junior, I believe. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that could be because I think uh, – I know that he played at Michigan State. I believe he played under Saban and ended up being an all-pro. But anyway, it's like – People can talk about uh, entitled five stars and four stars and prima donnas and all that. Well, okay, well, Alabama and Georgia have them every year, but you don't see them talking and making, you know, everyone's held accountable at those other programs, but n not at College Station right now. No, it, uh, like I said, I, I don't know what's going on there. The Tigers, they grabbed an early lead and uh, just really hung on, basically. Robbie Ashford... And uh, no indictment against the kid, but costly mistakes that he made just kept Auburn from putting this game away early. I think he's a great athlete. He may develop into a an SEC quarterback, but he's he's not right now. But that Tiger defense, they played outstanding. And uh, as I said, the offense did just enough uh, so Auburn could win. They tried to give it away, but uh, the defense uh, kept making big plays, and the offense did some things when they had to, to to secure the win. One thing that impressed me, and I talked to several people who were at the game, that Auburn spirit, it was evident. I mean, the fans, they weren't cheering like they were supporting a 3-16. and 16. Uh, I mean, they were, it was almost like an iron ball atmosphere. And this, this is not my opinion. This is coming from people who were there. They said that at times the stadium was unbelievably loud. Uh, you know, and when Andres uh, Carlson, he kicked a, 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 a field goal after a great defensive stand that uh, set up a, another field goal, get 13 to, to three. Aggies did get a late TD pass, but they couldn't get the onside kick. Now the Aggies have their first lose, a uh, six game losing streak since 1972. $90 million, six-game losing streak for the first time in 50 years. Hey, I know it sounds like it's piling on, but remember in preseason, everyone was telling me about how Texas A&M was a good bet at 25-1 to 1 to win it all and this and that, and they can't even win their division, and now they've got seven losses. And look, 
Alabama is the most penalized team in the country, and A&M last night did their impression of Alabama. They had eight penalties. The They allowed 270 rushing yards on 55 attempts. Coach Auburn said, hey, we're going to line up. We're not going to try to pass it. We're just going to line up and punch you right in your face and run it right down your throat. And that's what they did. And, you know, the Tiger players, that was the question. How do we determine who wants it more? Tigers wanted it more. They win. They cover. And, of course, at 13 to 10, the game stays well under the total. Cadillac Williams has done a great job of leading this team the last couple of weeks. I don't think that right now that he is the long-term answer for Auburn, but he's just what the Tigers need right now to get through this season. And if I'm the new head coach, the first hire that I'm making is Cadillac Williams. Coach, well, not only that, but if they do not find, because I don't know, I do not know who the perfect fit is because there might not be one right now that's available, ready and willing. And so you say Cadillac Williams is not the long-term answer. I agree, but he may be the answer for 23 until basically be a gatekeeper or placeholder until they find someone that, that truly does fit Auburn. You know, it's again, we call it the dumpster fire bowl for a reason. And uh, they're both living up to it. All right, moving on to our picks of the week. Uh, I had Kansas State. I had a feeling that Chris Kleiman and the Wildcats were going to play well. Uh, had never beaten Baylor since he's been at Kansas State, beaten a lot of other marquee names uh, multiple times, but had never beaten Baylor. They took care of Baylor last night. 31 to 3. And then uh, you had, you liked Arkansas to cover over LSU. And it looked like you had the crystal ball. You looked at it, talked about the weather. And, uh, and LSU, just like Alabama, LSU, they left a lot of themselves on the turf at Tiger Stadium last weekend. And, uh, and I think maybe that's why it took Alabama a little bit of time to get going. And when I said, you know, they found their identity earlier, the Tide found their identity earlier, is when they got in the when they got in that fourth quarter, they could have easily kind of checked in their chips, but they really dug down, which I think is is a sign of great coaching. And I think we saw that with LSU also. You know, they did nowhere near play their best game. But at the same time, Brian Kelly and that coaching staff, he had those guys and they were able to dig down and and get done what they needed to get done at the crucial times during that football game. And they they kind of uh, uh, they kind of breathe the sigh of relief and get out of Fayetteville, Arkansas with a win. Yeah, and, you know, Coach, normally when I give a, a free pick on here or any of our shows, I don't go into much detail. I'll give a couple of stats. But I went into a lot of detail because LSU was in a very bad spot, okay? Now, this is for the listeners that do happen to wager on games. So this is what, what happened. So all the weather, of course, I watch Weather Channel every day, not just for sports, just because I'm weird and I like weather. And I knew that come 11 o'clock Central Time, LSU, you had Jaden Daniels, the kid from California that played in the desert at Arizona State. He plays at Baton Rouge. You could see him coach his hands. He, he was freezing the whole game, right? But so then a wrench gets thrown in to my perfect storm scenario. A few minutes before kickoff, it's announced that Jefferson's not going to play. So the line goes from three and a half to four to like five and six. And I did not like Arkansas plus five or six with the backup quarterback. Of course, they finished the game. They covered. They finished the game with a third string quarterback. But to make a, a long story a little bit shorter, it's already too long. Uh, when the game, when Arkansas was up three nothing in Pittman before he went for it on fourth down, I played in game on LSU minus one to get off the bet because I didn't want I didn't want the bet anymore. So I ended up winning both, getting lucky. But the point is, is LSU it doesn't mean they've regressed. It's just those type of spots are what you're looking for in college football, and they were in a bad spot, and they couldn't even cover against a third-string quarterback. Well, I want to ask, do you have a relative or close friend that is the groundskeeper at Arkansas? Because 
uh, you know, as as uh, when as soon as Jefferson was announced that he wasn't going to play, all of a sudden they started spraying water on the field, thinking that's going to help the ice go away. I, I, I didn't get that aspect of it. So, well, you have any ideas on that? No, no. There's a lot of conspiracy theories out there. <laughs> Remember back to the Patriots where they bring the guy out on the little machine to clear out the space? Yes. To, you know, that reminiscent of that, not quite as egregious. But yeah. yeah, I was watching that and everything was playing to form or, or going to form. I'm like, okay, look, LSU players, they're freezing. They're freezing. There's They're scraping up man-made ice off the field. Yeah. This is perfect. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah, by the way, your mm -hmm. perfect storm, K.J. Jefferson, he won't play today. But <laughs> we escaped and got the win. And yeah. uh, LSU, I mean, look, they, they had to hear all week about how great they are and how they're going to be the first two-loss college football playoff team. And that uh, chance is still there. Moving on to this week, uh, best SEC game, uh, Georgia at Kentucky. And uh, Kentucky got slapped in the face uh, earlier uh, this past weekend. The Pac-12 championship game is going to get clear after next week. Utah and Oregon scheduled, but that game has lost its luster with the Oregon loss. And then USC and UCLA, but then after Arizona upset UCLA, that game's also lost its luster. Now, in the Big 12, TCU goes to Baylor. Now, Mike, with, I almost look at this almost like an LSU-Arkansas game. No, you're right. It is. It's a road game against Baylor that got thoroughly whipped last week, Okay. And Dave Aranda, very similar coaching style to Sam Pittman as far as, like, uh, culture and physicality. So you know those players, they're, they, they should be ready to play for this game. Um, you talked about Kentucky. They lost to Vanderbilt. Vandy had lost 20 straight, 26 straight SEC games, so that's a terrible loss for the Wildcats. And the Pac-12, I mentioned it earlier. They caved to November pressure again. Oregon lost as a two-touchdown favorite. Bruins lost as a three-touchdown favorite. That really hurts the Pac-12 champions' chances of getting in the playoff. Uh, and they folded. That conference has folded in November multiple times over the last 15 years. Uh, TCU, they're not out of the woods yet. They have that game at Baylor. And, uh, and even if they get past Baylor, it would be so apropos for a Matt Campbell Iowa State team sitting there with multiple losses to go to beat TCU. And then because odds makers and pundits, they love Matt Campbell. OK, but he underperforms. But that would be a game that would be typical of Iowa State to come in. And remember, they knocked Oklahoma State out of that 2011 uh, BCS title game. Yeah, I was going to say, and Matt Campbell wasn't even the coach then. Iowa State is just, uh, they have a reputation as playing spoiler and uh, and just basically throwing people's seasons out the window just when they're, you don't expect it. Yeah, yep. And then, uh, you know, so the, I, I think I'm impressed with TCU, especially how they won. If they would have, if they would have won a high scoring shootout, you know, that would have been impressive on the road as a seven-point dog. But the way they they handled Texas, and it it honestly, it wasn't as close as 17 to 10. It was oh, no. a more solid win. And uh, But as we talk about trap games, and so TCU, they've got this pressure of November. They have to go to Texas and win. They did that. They have to go to Baylor and win. Plus, they just saw those kids, they saw Baylor get walloped. 31 to three. And so they might let their guard down a bit. And then you have to play Iowa State, who has, you know, a losing record, but they have, you know, talented enough players to play with. And plus, they make a game look so ugly. Iowa State, their games are like 10 to nine sometimes. So they're not your typical Big 12 team. So they're not out of the woods, but uh, last night was a huge step for uh, Horn Frogs getting into the playoff. Mike, this is that kind of weird week in college football that happens every year where you don't have a lot of marquee matchups, but you're you're looking forward to the week after with the, uh, you know with your Ohio State, Michigan, with your 
Auburn, Alabama with those type games. And it's easy. It's very easy to just, as you said, just kind of overlook who you have next week. And sometimes, especially if you're in line to play for a championship, uh, overlooking someone can cost you right now. Yeah, and uh, I haven't uh, – I don't know what the line's going to be, but Georgia's going to be a hefty favorite over Kentucky. Georgia's a machine. They're looking great. and But Kentucky just coming off that loss, they can ugly up a game, right? And we've seen Georgia struggle with a 26-22 to 22 win at Missouri. So I don't think straight up, but I think against the point spread, depending on the line, Kentucky may be a spot we're looking at too. Well, Mike, appreciate your time as always. You get to your NFL Sunday, and uh, we'll have you back on the morning blitz tomorrow morning. Great. Look forward to it, Coach.